This video contains spoilers for Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy VII Remake, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, and Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. If you haven't played FF7, you owe it to yourself to play this game, or to watch someone play through this game. Seriously, don't let this video be how it's spoiled for you. Go play. Okay, spoilers start now. No, I, I'm serious. I didn't say this in the first one because it in itself is a spoiler, but even if you know the biggest spoiler in video game history, go play the game. I promise, knowing does not detract from the enjoyment of this game. Okay, for real this time. Spoilers start now. I know for most people, this is an inevitability. I mean, it's like going into The Empire Strikes Back for the first time knowing Darth Vader is Luke's father. It's one of those things that I don't even remember how it got spoiled for me. The knowledge has just always been in my head. The cutscene specifically has always been in my head, which is wild to me. I have no idea where it came from or how I first saw it. But earlier this year, so like two and a half months ago, I decided, you know what? I already know the biggest spoiler, which sucks, but I've heard nothing but good things about this game. So I might as well play the remake. So I started Final Fantasy VII Remake and it clicked immediately. Like, genuinely instantaneously. Like the opening cutscene, I was like, oh, I'm going to beat this game. Now, I'm not the best at recognizing twists before they happen, but what I can recognize are tropes. And let me tell you, Jesse, Wedge, and Biggs, I didn't think they were making it out of the first mission. I was pleasantly surprised, but still something told me they weren't long for this world. Now, obviously, you know I was right here and so did I. Like, you see this crew, there's enough foreshadowing between them in the dialogue that you can assume what is eventually going to happen. But even despite knowing, their deaths hit hard. And this is where I got concerned. You see, I went into this game, as I mentioned, knowing Aerith's fate. I knew that at the end of the game, Sephiroth killed Aerith. Now, some of you, um, have immediately kind of perked up a little bit while you're watching this video in the background because you've noticed something uh, untrue about that previous sentence. Mind you, uh, at the time, I did not know that was untrue. So my goal to protect myself here was simple. Don't get too attached. I failed miserably. You are not immune to Brianna White's performance as Aerith Gainsborough. But you know what's crazy? Knowing what was coming didn't dampen the blow. At all. I mean, it's foreshadowed heavily at the end of Remake, and even outright said in Rebirth. And let me tell you, the minute the Temple of the Ancients was mentioned, I got concerned. Because I know what the original cutscene looks like. It looks like a temple. Suddenly, I realized that I didn't even have the biggest spoiler of this spoiler. It doesn't happen at the end. I know you all know this, because you all watching this have now been waiting for me to realize this, and let me tell you, I was shocked. It's at the end of Disc 1. But seriously, Knowing Aerith's fate did not take away from it at all when it happened, because the main point of this twist isn't the shock, it's the emotion of it. Look, I've talked about twists before, I've expressed my distaste for the end of Now You See Me, but the main difference between that god-awful ending and this is that there's emotional weight and stakes to this, especially in the remakes. I understand being disappointed the remakes aren't one-to-one -one or the changes were made. I disagree, but I get where you're coming from. With that being said, I spent 110 hours, both in Remake and in Rebirth, thinking that this huge twist that I already knew about was going to be at the end of whatever Part 3 was going to be called. And not until the last 10 or 15 hours of Rebirth did I realize, oh no, it's happening now. The dread I felt is deeper and more impactful than any shock of it happening could have been. A good twist is foreshadowed. A great twist outright tells you it's happening right before it does. And that's the other thing. I forgot about it for a little bit because I was so focused on the fact that I think that the Nibelheim twists, the, the multitude and series of them, are bigger twists, in quotes, than Aerith's fate is. Let me explain. Characters die in Final Fantasy VII. We've already established that death is something that happens to named characters in this world with Jesse, Wedge, and Biggs. So a party member dying, while shocking and undoubtedly a twist, is less so than everything we learn about in Nibelheim. So here's the reveal of my play order that you probably could have guessed by what I've said already. Final Fantasy VII Remake, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, Final Fantasy VII for the PlayStation 4. So going into the original as I played it, I assumed I already knew the Nibelheim twist. <laughs> this floored me. Truly had me saying what out loud to myself alone in my room 
over and over. I assumed I knew everything because of Rebirth. I assumed I was going to get like one more twist in. I thought it was weird they were revealing things earlier, but I figured, hey, you know, you get one more twist in the third game. This photo, the reveal of this photo is the moment I sat forward in my chair and truly realized I was nowhere near done with the reveals this game had to offer. I knew there were probably more, but this was the perspective of just how many more. And from that point onward, the story had me hooked, like very few stories have had me in the past. And I can't say for sure it would have hit as hard if I didn't think I already knew the twist. I cannot put into words how truly shocked and gobsmacked I was. I thought, going into this, because I already knew about Aerith's fate, nothing huge was going to shock me. But seriously, I knew nothing else about this game. Like, I knew Sephiroth and Cloud existed, and that's it. And now I know too much, and the people around me are begging me to stop asking them to play Final Fantasy VII. But I want to talk about the Nibelheim twist, specifically in Rebirth, and why I like it a lot. Presumably in Part 3, we're going to learn that Cloud was not the soldier at Nibelheim, and the other grunt was the one who went down the river, and the truth of what happened later at the reactor. Which, also, side note that I have to mention, you can hear Cloud calling out for his mom in the grunt uniform, and then as he's launched back, he is then in the position the guard we just saw was in. This is really cool, and something that I fully didn't register my first playthrough of Rebirth, but in watching cutscenes after playing the original, I noticed this insane level of foreshadowing. Even Cody Christian's performance is off, different from the Cloud we know. It's setting up a second, massive twist that I love, that you kind of don't read into too much if it's your first time playing the game. Now, here, Rebirth does something that I think works incredibly well considering the context of the game that we're playing. When Tifa confides in Aerith that Cloud wasn't in Nibelheim five years ago, the mystery that we're currently watching amplifies tenfold, especially for me who didn't know what was going on. He had too many details not to be there, right? And then later, learning that Zack died makes too much sense. We met his parents, and we haven't seen him except in flashbacks and presumably what is weird timeline shenanigans. So what's going on? And this is where my real struggle begins. I think that some of the mysteries are better done in the remakes, but by the nature of what they are, they don't completely work without the context of the original. Now, I don't completely agree with my own opinion on this. L let me explain. You see, I've been upfront about the fact that all I knew about Final Fantasy VII was Aerith's fate. I guess I also knew Sephiroth existed, but you know. Remake and Rebirth both had me completely engaged with the story and with the mysteries of all of it, strange timeline shenanigans and all. When I first played Remake, I was operating under the assumption that the green glitches were the damaged parts of Cloud's memory, based on when they happened. I then began to assume they were directly caused by Sephiroth based on his appearances. I also assumed up until like the last two chapters that Sephiroth was completely an illusion that only Cloud could see. This of course was proven completely wrong when Palmer saw him, but that made that moment incredibly exciting, because it began to get my mind working again and again about what was going on. And then came the crossroads of Destin. Reminder, I didn't know this fight wasn't in the original game until I played the original game. I just assumed this all happened in the original game, and I knew it was part one of three, so I assumed my questions would be answered in part two or part three. So imagine my surprise when they walk past Cloud and this random dude I've never seen. Now, I tend to trust writers, especially of long RPGs, to set stuff up that won't make any sense now and will click into place in 20 to 30 hours. It's what happens in this kind of storytelling. Yeah, so the opening of Rebirth was really confusing for me. I decided quite early on into playing Rebirth that I was going to play OG. This game felt so ambitious and so grand that I had to know how they pulled it off in 1997. And to no one's surprise, the game touted as one of the best games of all time is really good. Before I started, I knew I was going to kind of speed through for story stuff, but that happened less and less as I went on. As much as I enjoy turn-based combat and RPGs, it always got very stale to me very fast, and I don't enjoy grinding. I think it's a side effect of playing too much Fire Emblem. That makes sense if you don't think about it. But I was here for the story. I enjoyed the combat enough, and I think it's a cool system, but I always think it's tough going from modern turn-based RPGs and leaving most of the quality of life changes behind. But it holds up really well. That being said, I quickly realized just how much of this game was expanded upon, and I found myself hooked in a way I didn't expect much earlier on. This is the only remake that I've ever played that's made me want to go buy and play the original game. The story had me so hooked that I needed to know what happened next. I couldn't stand the idea of waiting four to six years before getting a conclusion, and I'm so glad I played the original. It gave me an appreciation for Remake and for Rebirth and the things they're setting up. I'm so excited for part three, whatever it's going to be called. Let me know what your predictions in the comments. I'm insatiably curious to know what people think it's going to be called. So what's the conclusion for this video? 
Well, maybe it's this. Final Fantasy VII is really good. I, I know, hottest take in the world. So maybe it's actually closer to being confused during the remakes was worth it because it got me to play the original. I don't know. I don't have people to talk about this because none of my friends have played this game and it feels morally wrong to spoil these things for my own selfish need to talk about them. So I make these videos. See also High School Musical, the musical series, Unis Honest, The After Party, Cowboy Bebop, and uh, an upcoming video that hopefully will get done. You know what? I, I think I actually, I found the conclusion. My main takeaway after playing Final Fantasy VII Remake, Rebirth, and then the original is this. It takes a really special kind of game and a special story to make you feel genuine emotion about a twist you already knew was coming. They did it for me with Aerith's death, and I think they'll do it for all of us again in Nibelheim. Unfortunately, that title thumbnail combo would go against the whole not spoiling the almost 30 year old game philosophy that I hold near and dear to my heart and refuse to break. So you get this instead. Thanks for watching.